Welcome to Electricity and Magnetism. We're going to start by defining electric charges. There are two charges in electromagnetism, positive, we call them positive and negative. Now those are somewhat arbitrary choices of names, but it, it works out um, and it makes the math nice and neat. We could have switched the, the way they're named and it would have been, uh, the math would be basically the same, just flipping the signs. Um, we call the, the positive charges positive because, well, Ben Franklin, when he named them and thought that the charge carriers would be positive, and it turned out that actually it was the negative charge carriers that were moving around, the electrons. Um, so in, if you take, uh, how we know that, we, that you have charges um, and how you can in your own, in the comfort of your own home, see that there are in fact electric charges is that you can take two objects and rub them together. So if you take something like amber um, and you rub it against a cloth, uh, the, um, you will rub some of the charges off onto the, um, you'll rub some of the electric charges from the, the electrons from the cloth and get them onto the amber, which leaves a net negative charge. Um, so, and then you will notice that the, the amber and the cloth are in fact attracted to each other. Um, when you do this, the, the net charge is still zero. You are not creating charge. You are, uh, you are simply rearranging the charges in the material that we have. Um, and you can also, another way that we knew this, so back in the early days when we didn't have, uh, when we were still figuring all of this stuff out, they had some rather cool instruments to figure out what electricity was and how it worked. Um, and what they used to do um, to get large amounts of charges so they could conduct these experiments, it wasn't like you could run out to the store and buy a battery because we didn't know what a battery was. And we didn't have a model of electricity and magnetism to tell us how to build all this cool stuff. What they did was use something called a Leiden jar, named after the city of Leiden in the Netherlands. Um, and you would basically just rub really hard on the outside, which was coated in a metal, and uh, and deposit or um, remove charges. And so you could use these large, and you, it basically was a large capacitor. So you had two plates of metal separated slightly um, using a glass jar. And uh, that, you would remove charges and then build up a large amount of charge. And by connecting a lot of these, you could build up what, for the time, was a, a very um, large amount of charge. You can actually see the original Leiden jars from 1789 in the Tyler Museum in Harlem in the Netherlands. It's really a cool place, although a little bizarre because they have all sorts of these old apparatuses where you can see where they did the original experiments. Awesome. If you're ever in the Netherlands, you should go. Um, so then when you rub these charges, so one way to get, charge, to get attraction to the electromagnetic force is to, to remove charges and get some sort of net charge. Um, but another is to simply polarize something. That means to just shift the charges on something from one side to the other. Um, so we now know, now that we have a much more advanced model of, of matter, we now know that the nucleus is a small, positively charged center surrounded by a cloud of electrons. And you don't actually have to pull the electron off. You just have to shift the electron cloud ever so slightly relative to the nucleus to get it to be polarized. So instead, here you can see the electron cloud. And instead of having it be centered around the nucleus, you shift it ever so slightly. And now you have more positive charge on this side and more negative charge on that side. This, uh, so we call this polarization. Um, and you actually can get attraction between two different objects that are polarized, even without having, um, even without removing electrons. Um, and, and this is true whether you have, so this is showing the, a simple model of hydrogen, but you can take something more complicated. Um, this is carbon. It has six electrons. Now, really, they're all clouds of electrons. They've drawn these little dots, but there's not, it, it's much more diffuse than that. Um, so you, either way, you can end up just pulling the electron cloud or pushing the electron cloud slightly so that it's no longer centered around the nucleus. And that will lead to polarization. Um, so if you take something like, so now we have a metal sphere. And you can take a positively charged uh, object, such as a glass rod. You can charge the, the glass rod um, by rubbing it against a cloth, which removes, removes some of the electrons. 
when you take this positively charged um, rod and you put it near a metal sphere, it is going to push all the positive charge away and from the, the, elect the rod, and it's going to pull all the negative charge away. Now, this, uh, this slightly exacerbates the, the situation. Um, it's not as polarized as this, but um, regardless, you end up with uh, um, you end up with net negative charge here, net positive charge there, um, and the two are attracted to each other. Now, when we talk about metals and how electrons move inside of metals, we often model a metal as being a perfect conductor, so the electrons can move completely freely. You can you can think of it as a liquid of electrons free to slosh around inside of the metal. Um, and this is, this is an example of how you can polarize something. So you polarize the metal by moving a positive charge um, near it. You aren't actually removing or you're not removing electrons, you're just rearranging them inside the material. Um, so uh, you can end up with both, both positive and negatively charged, positive and positively charged and negatively charged objects attracting a neutral object um, by polarizing the neutral object's molecules. So here, if you take a positive uh, rod and you move it near some object, it's going to pull the negative charges towards it and push the positive charges away so that the object ends up with more net negative charge here and more net positive charge over here. So there's an asymmetry in the distribution of charges. And then there's more negative charge here, so the positive charged rod is attracted to the neutral object. Here you have a negatively charged rod, and you attract a, um, and you put it near a neutral object. There it pulls the positive charges towards it and pushes the negative charges away. So you end up with a net. Po uh, the neutral object is polarized, so there's net positive charge here and net negative charge here. Now, if you have a metal. Um, or a, some type of conductor, a metal is a type of conductor, then you have uh, the charges able to move freely inside of the medium. And instead of simply rearranging the charges where, so in the case of polarization, you are only deforming the electron cloud. You're not actually removing a charge. In the case of a metal, you are actually moving the charge carrier. So in this case, the, um, the positive charge carriers line up on the side of the, um, they line up on the side with the positive, with the negatively charged rod because they're more attracted to the negatively charged rod. So polarization is simply deformation of the electron cloud, um, but you still can get some, you can still um, end up getting uh, the same effect for, uh, for a conductor. All right, so you can also charge something by induction. So you can use the fact that electrons are pushed away even if an object is net neutral. So here, you take two neutral spheres. They are two metal neutral, neutral metal spheres. They're touching each other. Um, move a charged rod next to it. In this case, it is a positively charged rod. And all of the negative charges are going to line up near the positively charged rod. That has to be compensated by positive charges somewhere. So the, the positive charges are pushed on the push to the other side, which happens in this case to be uh, another sphere. So all the positive charges are here. Then you separate the two spheres. Electrons and positive charges can no longer freely flow on the surfaces of these spheres. So uh, they end up net charged. Um, remove the rod. This sphere still has a net negative charge, and that still sphere still has a net positive charge. Um, so they uh, the spheres are now attracted to each other, and because the electrons can and the, pro, the elect, electrons and protons can slosh around roughly freely inside of these metal spheres, they're going to preferentially line up close to each other so that they minimize the amount of energy in the system. Um, and you can do this even if you don't have spheres connected, because you can think about the the ground, the the rest of the um, the rest of the planet as being an infinite reservoir of charge of either type. So you do the same exercise, move, take a metal sphere, move a charged rod near it, in this case positively charged. It attracts all of the electrons and repels all of the, all of the, attracts all the positive, attracts all the po negative charges, repels the positive charges. 
And then you create a connection to the ground so that current can flow. That means that the charges move from the sphere to the ground. So there's now fewer positive charges on the sphere itself. Remove the connection to the ground, um, breaking the circuit. We'll talk about circuits in a, in a couple chapters. So you remove the, the ground, and then you have the, um, you still have the rod nearby, so there's fewer, there's net negative charge here. Remove the rod, and the sphere is going, the, the sphere is going to rearrange the charge, but it's still going to have a net negative charge. So this is charging by induction. So you are inducing a charge on the sphere. Now, when we have two objects that have charges, we have an attractive force between the two of them. And that attractive force is given by, the magnitude is given by something called the Coulomb constant times the first charge times the product of the first charge times the, uh, times the second charge divided by the distance between them squared. This Coulomb constant happens to be 8.99 times 10 to the ninth newtons per Coulomb squared per meter squared. So this will give us SI units. Um, we also sometimes uh, use this fact that the Coulomb constant equals 4 pi times epsilon, not, 1 over 4, 4 pi times epsilon naught. This is the permittivity of free space, another physical constant. I personally, when working on electromagnetism, prefer to just keep the Coulomb constant because it's just one number, um, but they do work out to be the same number. Initially, we didn't know that those two constants were related to each other, um, but then Maxwell came and explained electricity and magnetism to us, and then there was light, and now we know that those two, uh, that those two constants are related to each other. So this is the magnitude of the electric force. A force, of course, consists of both a magnitude and a direction because it is a vector. The direction is always pointing towards or away from the two charges. So if you, um, if you choose the vector here, the vector in the direction of the, um, the vector in the direction of where you're pointing between, towards, each, towards the other particle, so the force of charge one on charge two points towards charge two, uh, or sorry, the force of charge one on charge two points towards charge one, um, and then you watch the signs here so that if they're opposite sign, uh, they, let's see, if they're opposite sign, it has to be attractive. If, they're, uh, if they are the same sign, they are repulsive. So um, just watch the direction, but this gives you the magnitude. All right, so here we have uh, for instance, you have two negatively charged um, particles, a distance of R apart from each other, and you can have the, um, and then the force is given by the Coulomb constant times the product of the charges divided by the distance squared. In this case, it is repulsive. Now, the exact direction and the sign of that is going to depend on how you have, how you have drawn your coordinate systems. How you've, got, how you've drawn your coordinate system. So remember back from when we were working with um, introductory mechanics, I said, draw a picture, draw your coordinate system, uh, and then proceed with the problem. You're going to keep doing that skill here. Um, the coordinate system is going to tell you whether it's positive or negative and whether it's all lined up along um, one direction or the other. Now here, you have the same basic problem but we're going to flip the signs so that one is negative and one is positive. Now the force is attractive. So this, in this case, this is the force of uh, particle one on particle two. It pushes it away from, it pushes the particle two away from particle one. This is the force of particle two on particle one. It pushes particle one away from particle two. Here, this is the force of particle one on particle two. It pulls particle two towards particle one. This is the force of particle one on or particle two on particle one. It pulls particle one towards particle two. So, like charges attract, unlike charges repel, um, and this gives you the magnitude. And that and a whole lot of math tells you everything you need to know about elect uh, about uh, 
the electrostatic force. We say static, by the way, that means not changing. We're not yet dealing with moving charges. When we deal with moving charges, we'll have to introduce and work with the magnetic force. Okay, so this is a very simple depiction of the hydrogen atom. Um, and to a good approximation, you can consider the hydrogen, hydrogen atom as bound only by the electromagnetic force. Um, now, really, we now know that this electric, um, we know that the hydrogen atom is not um, represented by a tiny ball. Well, a nucleus is pretty close to a tiny ball of positive charge. But then the electron is actually smeared around and distributed everywhere. But the way that we developed our more advanced, um, our more advanced formulation called quantum mechanics that describes what this really does was to start with looking at the force of a charged particle um, in the field of the of a positively charged nucleus. Okay, and then um, here you can. Um, the, we introduce the concept of the superposition principle, which says that basically you can add up all of the forces from one charge, uh, or from all the different charges independently of each other. So if you are considering the forces on this positively charged capital Q here, I will call this our beach ball, if you're calculating the net force on our beach ball here, you can simply add up the forces from all of the other charges, the, the um, the blue and the yellow balls. And that will give you the net force on the positively charged, um, the positively charged particle Q. So the forces from different charges are additive. We will do examples. All right, and then um, here you can calculate the net force. Um, so you have source charges Q1 and Q3 and you can calculate the net force on those two. So we will do this as a vector problem. I'm gonna switch colors. So our force of one on two, and we are, or sorry, the force of, the force of one on two, I think actually your book uses the opposite notation. So that, that is going to be K Q one Q two over the distance between them, quantity squared, that distance is D. And then if we are asking, so these are um, let's see, this is showing the net, so this one is attractive, so this one is, if this is a negative charge, this one is a positive charge, and this one is a negative charge. So in that case, the force of Q uh, one on Q2 is in the positive y direction. Now, the force of 3 on 1, or sorry, the 3 on 2 is equal to K Q1, Q, or sorry, Q2, Q3 over the distance squared, which is 4, d squared, and then um, we need to have the unit vector in the direction of, so now this is repulsive, so charge 3 is pushing Q2 away, so this is in the negative x hat direction. And if you want the total force experienced by charge Q2, it is going to be the vector sum of those two forces. Um, and let's make the simplifying, let's say that all of the charges are equal to each other in magnitude. So those are the sums of the, we'll just call them all Q. And now the net force is going to equal K Q 
squared y hat over d squared minus x hat over 4d squared. So in the case that the magnitude of the two charges is the same, then you have one quarter the amount of force in the x direction than in the y direction. That's not quite what this picture draws. This, this picture looks like this was drawn only as a schematic. But the problem that I did, you move one quarter the amount in the x direction that you do in the y direction. So your net force would be something like that. So when you do these simple problems, you, uh, you use this equation. This is the magnitude, and then you have to figure out the direction. Usually figuring out the direction involves taking the coordinate system that you are using for that problem and um, lining your charges up with that, simplifying the math, and plowing through the math. I'm going to do in this chapter a few uh, cases where we'll do um, more complicated integrals. If you are still concurrently doing calculus, then you can skip over those sections. All right, the electric field. Often we have some complicated system of charges such as this, and we want to ask the question, well, if I plop a charge at in here, what is it? What other? What are the forces it's going to experience? If I have some, if I add some charge um, to this problem, so we define something called an electric field, and the electric field between or the electric field from a single charge is given by uh, the magnitude is k times the charge itself divided by the distance from the point. So that if you have a point charge with a certain, let's make this a, um, a positive charge. If you have a positive charge, you can draw field lines. Now the, the direction here is always going to point um, towards negative charges and away from positive charges. So then you can draw field lines and the field lines uh, point the field map is going to point to where the line arrows point where a positive charge dumped in that system would go. So close to the charge, you have large arrows because your, uh, your electric field is very large. And the electric field around a point charge is going to point out radially from the center. As you move further from the charge, your arrows get shorter. And let me make even shorter arrows here so that it sort of looks like a starburst as you move out from the object. So if you plop, what that tells you is that if you plop a positive charge in here, it is going to experience a force outward. And it's basically going to be pushed away from that charge. To get to the electric, the electric force, you write this as Q times the electric field. Uh, so now, the, the convenience of using the electric field formulation is, first of all, that you don't actually have to know which charge you're going to use. To figure out the magnitude of the electric force, you have to know all of the charges and all of their magnitudes. To get the electric field, uh, if you have the electric field, you don't care how you got, up, got that electric field. You uh, can still calculate the force of uh, a test charge in that electric field. So um, then what we can do is we can, if we were to switch the sign of this, so instead of having a positive charge, we have a negative charge, the direction of the arrows switches, but you end up getting exactly the same uh, configuration 
So all the arrows, instead of pointing away from the point charge, they're all going to point towards the point charge. Now, there are very few cases, at least in my class, when I will make you draw the field lines, um, but it is good to be able to read what that looks like, and you are certainly going to be expected to recognize what it is. So if you have a negatively charged a particle, I'm going to draw fewer here. Um, you have all of your, all of the arrows are going to point towards the particle, and as you move out, the arrows get shorter. And we'll work with different configurations where we figure out the electric field, but we are, uh, we don't, we don't care how we got, what charges led to that electric field. We just care that we know the electric field. All right, so here you can look at this case where there's eight different source charges. Um, we, ha or we have, uh, this actually, I think I can't see all eight of them on the, the picture here. I've got, that's two, three, five, one, four. Um, I think I see five, uh, five source charges. Um, they all have, uh, they create their own electric field. Now, each of the, uh, so because the electric force is additive, the electric fields are additive. So if you look at a test point P, the net electric field at that test point P is the sum of the electric fields of all of the, from all of the charges that you can see. Um, and the elect yeah, again, the electric field points where a positive test charge would want to go. Now, I'm describing this anthropomorphically. Obviously, electrons don't have feelings, but I think it does help to imagine what an, how an electric charge or, of some sort would get pushed around. Yeah, so then if you draw the electric field, because you have a positive, if this is a helium nucleus, um, if you have a positively charged nucleus and you're looking at the electrons in the uh, inside of an atom, the electric field from that positively charged nucleus um, is pointing out, uh, pointing away from the nucleus. And this is independent of, this is the field created by the nucleus alone. At this point, you don't actually care whether you've got electrons inside the atom or not, or whether it's an ion. Okay, when calculating fields, symmetry is your friend. Never forget my maxim, a good physicist is a lazy physicist. You can often use symmetry if not to make your life, and if not to do less work, at the very least to check your work. When you're learning, I actually would advocate not necessarily always using symmetry itself, don't, uh, unless you have to, to solve a problem. But if you have time, you know, use symmetry to tell yourself what the answer should look like, and then uh, double check yourself. Use that to double check yourself, because you should get an answer that looks the way you expect it to. Okay, so here we have two charges creating an electric field. And you are asked, what is the electric field at this point P? These two charges have the same sign. I can't quite read the diagram, so we're just gonna make it up. So we'll call this, we'll say that they are both positive. So now you have two positive charges. They create an electric field. You're asked at a point P, which is between the two of them laterally, and horizontally above them, what is the electric field? Now, the electric field from one positive charge points directly away from it. It's got a point on that line. The electric field from the other positive charge has to point in the, uh, away from it. This problem has a line of symmetry, meaning that I can reflect the problem about this line here and I get the, the image looks the same. So whatever, uh, whatever my solution is for the electric field, it has to be symmetric, meaning I get the same answer if I 
flip this over and switch this charge with that charge. That means I can't have any component horizontally because if I have any component to my net electric field that is horizontal, when I reflect about this line, I will change, the, I will reflect that horizontal component and my answer is not symmetric. Using that symmetry, I know that I have to have, um, I have to have only a vertical component to my electric field because my, uh, because there is this line of symmetry and I have to have the same answer if I flip this. Now, I'm gonna write out the answer the long way. I'm gonna choose an axis. Here, we will put our x-axis here, and we're going to put our y-axis here. So I already know that I really should only have a y component to my electric field. The electric field at point P, uh, let's see, if we have, so this is the angle theta, and this is going to be our sine theta. This is our cosine theta. Um, so if I draw the electric field, uh, if I write the equation for the electric field from, we'll call this charge 1, and this is going to be charge 2. So my electric field from charge 1 is going to be K Q1 over, ah, I did have to stipulate that these charges have the same magnitude, so we're just going to drop the 1. We're going to just call it KQ over, now the distance from point P is R squared, and now I have to come up with a unit vector in the direction, in this direction. So a unit vector is a vector which has length one. Um, and I have, if I want something which points in this direction, um, I can write, you know, let's first write the vector without making it a unit vector. Um, a vector which points from here to there that vector r is r sine theta x hat plus r sine or r cosine theta y hat. Now my unit vector is the vector divided by its length. Now conveniently, the length of this vector is r because the magnitude r dot r is r squared and this gives me r squared cosine squared theta plus r squared sine squared theta which is equal to simply r squared. So my length of my vector is simply r. So my unit vector, which we are going to call r hat, is sine theta x hat plus cosine theta y hat. So I can write the electric field. I can now use that. That is the unit vector uh, in the direction of the force from charge 1. So I have a sine theta x hat plus cosine theta y hat. Now, I can calculate the electric field from charge 2. My magnitude is the same. And now, my unit vector is, I, when I go look at the vector in this direction, I have a negative x direction here. Um, and I still have a positive y direction. 
You may repeat this exercise. I leave that as an exercise for the student where you can construct the unit vector in this direction. And you will see that it is the same, except there is a negative sign in front of the, the x component. So I have y. My electric field from charge 2 is kq over r squared, negative sine theta, x hat plus cosine theta y hat. Now, my net electric field is going to be the sum of these two because the, um, the electric fields are additive. And when I take that sum, these two terms cancel out, and I get a factor of 2 in front of these two terms. So my net electric field is kq, 2kq over r squared cosine theta. So what that means is, well, first of all, the farther I am from the two charges, the smaller my electric field. That makes sense. Here, you oh, and I dropped the y hat. All of my um, all of my electric field is in the y hat direction. I knew my answer had to work out like that because of symmetry. Um, so it's nice that when I did it this way, it worked out. I get an answer which is in fact symmetric. Um, and I see that the larger my electric charge is, the larger the, um, the, larger the, uh, the electric field. If I am at, so cosine is largest when the angle is small. So if my, I push my charges in here really close to each other, then the net electric field is larger. And that also makes sense because the, whatever component is in the x direction, whatever component, the, the shallower that angle, the more there is in the x direction, and the two x components cancel each other out. Okay, so when you have a problem like this, single charges, I like asking questions about single charges when I write exams because it's simple. Um, it leaves the math not too ugly, and I can check to see if you understand basic concepts. Um, it's the type of question where if you can't get that type of question, I know you're not going to get the more advanced type. Whereas for the students who are able to do the more advanced questions, it's a softball that maybe helps build up some confidence. So simple questions with... Uh, with single ch with a few number of, a few charges that's a nice neat question a little bit of symmetry can also be nice because it provides a way that you can double check your answer i'm going to go ahead and erase the equations because they've been up there for a while i think by now they're hopefully starting to get seared into your brain um, it's another one of those things that it would be good to have seared into your brain um, memorization doesn't work for everything but there are some things it's worth memorizing, and the rest you write down on a note sheet. All right, that's the basic principle, but these start to get really complicated. Um, I'm going to do a few integrals in this section. If you can't follow the integrals and you're still in calculus, that's okay. Feel free to skip over the parts that have calculus. This is not a calculus one. Okay, so you have four identical charges, um, and... There's a few different things that we can do here. Um, what we're going to do is calculate the force on a test charge right in the middle. And then we're also going to calculate the electric field um, everywhere. And I'll show you how that gives you the same answer as if you calculate the force on a test charge, as if you calculate. You can get this, the first answer from the second. All right, we're going to draw our coordinate system like this, x, y, and then you can see here, because the dimensions of the square are a, that this is at a over 2, a over 2, negative a over 2, and negative a over 2. Okay, so if we uh, have to calculate the net force, ah, and I'm going to call these charges for convenience, 1, 
two, three, four. Now I'm going to go ahead and make unit vectors. So we have a positive test charge here. And I'm going to make unit vectors in the direction of each of the four forces. So, in this case, the, um, the unit vector is away from charge Q. And so it's got two negative components. But they both have the same, it's at a 45 degree angle from the axis. So if I write my unit vectors for the, uh, for this charge, it's going to be negative x hat minus y hat. Now, this does not have a magnitude of 1, because if I take uh, the magnitude of each component squared, that's 1 squared plus, two, plus 1 squared is 2. So this has a magnitude of the square root of 2. So if I want to make this a unit vector, I have to divide by the square root of 2. All right, so this is my unit vector from charge 2. My unit vector from charge 1, again, this is going to push in this direction. So I have a negative y, um, but I have a positive x. From charge 3, it's going to point in the negative x and the positive y direction. And from part of charge 4, Four, it's going to point in the positive x, positive y direction. So all of my unit vectors are plus or minus, um, have a plus or minus x hat over the square root of, the, of 2 and a plus or minus y hat over the square root of 2. And now I just have to figure out which one it is for each component. So if I calculate the force, I'm going to calculate the force on charge Q from charge 1. And this is going to be, it's going to push it in this direction. Magnitude K Q squared over, now the distance is A squared, is A over 2, so I have an A squared over 4 for the distance. So, and then my unit vector is, in this case, I have the positive X hat, um, and the negative y hat. So I have x hat minus y hat over the square root of 2. The force from my second particle, from particle 2, has the same magnitude. And now um, particle 2 is going to push this particle in the um, negative x, negative y direction. And force of 3 is same magnitude. And now it's going to push it in the negative x, positive y direction. And the force from 4 has the same magnitude. And then um, the force from what I, oh, let's see, I may have, I think I switched three and four because I said negative, ah, let's see, this is, yeah, I switched three and four. This is four, so then I need three. And three is going to push in the negative x, oh, wait, negative x positive y, I did do that right. So then 4 is in the positive x, positive y. All right, now when I add these all up together, I have 
x hat minus x hat minus x hat plus x hat. That's zero. Negative y hat minus y hat plus y hat plus y hat. That's zero. So my net force is equal to zero. Now, you can see that if you were slightly off to, the, to one side or the other, that the, the forces experienced from the other. So now, if I'm just here, then these two are a little further. These forces are a little stronger. And it's going to push it back towards the center. But if I were slightly off here, so now it's going to push here, it's going to push it back um, that way. So it does make sense. If I'm right there, I do have a zero um, net force. Now I'm going to write out the equations for the electric field from each charge at this at some point here for each charge. And I'm going to. So in general, the electric field is going to be given by K Q. So the electric charge from one particle is K Q and then uh, X square, let's see, X minus the position of the charge, quantity squared, plus y minus the position of the charge in y, quantity squared. So this is writing the distance from the, arb from the charge relative to some arbitrary point. And what's going to change here is that I'm going to have positive and negative um, a over 2 there. Now the unit vector away from that is going to be, I, let's see, I have to be a little careful here. Um, let me just write that as the magnitude and not yet worry about the vector. My unit vector is going to be always pointing outward. So if we take charge one, my unit vector away is going to be the x position minus the x position of my charge in the x hat direction plus the y position minus the y position of my charge in the y hat direction, and then divided by that length. And I am realizing now that I set myself up for a very ugly challenge. OK, so that's my unit vector. It's ugly. The good news is that. Uh, when we choose a point, so when we choose 0, 0, um, the origin, there's a lot of cancellation that goes on. So I can then, and I think I'm going to go ahead and do that so that the math is not intractable, because um, I don't have room for four pages of algebra on this whiteboard. So I'm going to look at the electric field from point one, uh, from charge one. And we'll start by writing the general case. This is KQ over X. And then I, this one is at negative X. The, the coordinate here is negative A over 2, positive A over 2. So I have x plus a over 2 squared. And then here I have x 
minus a over 2 quantity squared, and then my unit vector gives me this to the power of 3 halves times x minus uh, x plus a over 2 x hat plus x minus a over 2 y hat evaluated at the origin so at the very least you've seen how to draw out the how to write out the really big ugly form of the equation Evaluated at the origin, this is Q, KQ, you always have an A over 2, X hat minus Y hat. And then here, I have A over 2 quantity squared plus a over 2 quantity squared to the 3 halves. So I have 2 a squared over 4 quantity to the 3 halves. Whew. And this works out to be, let's do some side math. I have a over 2 on the top from this. And then here I have 2 to the third. Divide, 2 to the third is 8. And then the square root of 8 is 2 root 2. And then here I have a over 2 quantity squared. Take the square root and make it cubed. So I have a cubed over 8. And that mess gives me, I get 1a canceling out. So I get, uh, I get 1a canceling out and then I have one half over there's a square root of two and then a two over four so i have a four here and let's see i think i got This should work out to be 4 over the square root of 2, so I think I have an extra 2. So over 2. Ah, this is my mistake. So I have this one. Let's see, I should get the, the two should cancel out the A over two there. Think if I, I think I have an extra two there, so I have a two that cancels out. So there's still a two. There should be a two. There should be an ah. There should be an extra two right. Oh, no, this is right. 
Okay, there. Then I have four, I have eight divided by two is four, and I have four over the square root of two. All right, so that gives me the, an electric field which has the same form there. I multiply by the, um, so this electric field is KQ x hat minus y hat over a squared over 4. And then my I multiply by the test charge to get the net, my, the net force. And I will get the same answer if I do it with field versus with forces. And now you have seen an example where you write out in long, ugly detail what happens for each of the contributing charges. It can get ugly fast. I would recommend, when there, especially when there's a symmetry, I would recommend sticking with symbolic notation until the very end because it's easier to catch your mistakes and not have to rewrite all of the algebra. If you plug in numbers right away and you catch a mistake early on, then you have to redo all of the math. And look out for those symmetries. When we did this problem, when you look at the very center, it only makes sense that the, um, the net force from each charge is the same, so you, by symmetry, should end up getting zero net force and zero net electric field. There's going to be a few simple problems like that where you're just using point charges on the homework. I like to ask a question like that on the exam as well because if you don't get a problem like that, then you probably struggle with some of the more advanced concepts too. All right. Here we have concrete numbers, so we can calculate the force on these two, the force between these two charges. So you have a positively charged here, charge, positively char, positive charge here, a negative charge here. The force is attractive, and we can calculate the magnitude of that force. So we have K equals 8.99 times 10 to the ninth newtons per coulomb squared meters squared. Our force, the magnitude of our force is K Q1 Q2 over R squared. So we have 8.99 times 10 to the ninth newtons per coulomb squared meters squared divided by 4 meters squared, because we have two meters quantity squared. Now we have 10, or we have one microcurie, which is 10 to the negative six curies, times negative three microcuries. So negative three times 10 to the negative sixth. I said curies, I mean coulombs. 10 to the negative six coulombs, Negative 3 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. All right, now let's look at our units. I'm going to make some cancellations here. I have coulombs squared, and I have 2 coulombs in the numerator. So I can cancel those coulombs out. Here I have meters squared, so I can cancel those out. And I have, if I pull the, the powers well, let's first round this to nine. So I have nine times three on the top is 27. And it's a negative sign. In this case, that indicates that it is attractive. Um, so I have negative 27 divided by four. And then I have 10 to the ninth times 10 to the negative sixth, times 10 to the negative sixth. And with exponents, I can add them up. So I have nine minus six minus six is negative three. So I have 
negative 27 over 4 times 10 to the negative 3. This is about 28, and I can do 28 divided by 4 evenly. Um, so 28 divided by 4 is just 7, so this is about 7 times 10 to the negative 3, and my units are newtons. It is useful, even though you guys have handy-dandy calculators, it is useful to be able to do these things roughly by hand because one of the most common mistakes that I see, both on exams and on homework, is plugging numbers in incorrectly. In particular, often you have all of the work correct, and then you go to plug the numbers in wrong, you have fat fingers on your calculator, or more often you're plugging in some complicated equation and you miss a parenthesis or misplace a parenthesis, and the answer ends up being weird, and it gives you some error. So it is worth making, uh, being very meticulous. It is also worth being able to check by hand. All right, when we start talking about much more complicated calculations, so far we've talked about point charges. Often we're dealing with distributions of charges, and you want to be able to describe the field um, or the force experienced by, well, usually we're, off, we're talking about fields, the, when you have uh, different configurations of charges. And we're going to work with um, the integral form. So this is a section where if you are concurrently in calculus, and this is a little over your head, it's okay if you can stick with me. It's going to pay off because then it's more familiar when you get to your upper division electricity and magnetism. The first pass, you could also skip through it and then come back to it later after you're a little more solid on the basic concepts. So we're going to use the form. So we're going to use the electric field is K Q over the, um, the distance squared, and then there's some unit vector. Now, we're going to look at small segments of the electric field and integrate over all of the charges in order to figure out what the electric field is. And there's a few different ways that we can do this. Sometimes we're going to use... Um, Sometimes we're going to use line charges, so we have some uniform distribution of charge along a line, and then we, we'll integrate along some segment BL. Um, we will often choose to line ourselves up with some axis, by, so by symmetry we don't have to do all of the integrals. All of the integrals can get rather ugly, even for somebody who loves ugly integrals like me. Um, Sometimes we're going to integrate over a surface um, when we have, say, a uniform, a roughly uniform surface charge. Um, and, uh, and sometimes we're going to integrate over a volume when we have some uniform, uh, when we have a uniformly, a charge uniformly distributed over a volume. These symmetries will reduce the number of integrals that you have to solve. So sometimes we're going to use them. Sometimes if the ugly integrals are not too onerous, I'm actually going to do the ugly integrals and show you that you get the answer that you would have expected from symmetry. OK, so now we're going to talk about what happens around a uniformly charged segment of wire. And this is going to show you how to calculate the electric field for these more complicated distributions of charges. So what we're going to start with is noting that the, a small segment of electric field is given by K and then a small segment of the charge, the unit vector in the direction of, that, um, of the electric field, and then the distance between the point and the, um, and the charge itself. So when we do this, we have to be a little bit careful um, we have to calculate this small segment of charge as well as calculating the unit vector and make sure that, uh, that we get all of the factors put together. So um, a small segment of charge, what we're going to do is say that there is a charge Q, which is smeared out over this length L, um, so that we will then define 
the charge density is lambda equals Q over L. Now, if we look at the, um, the electric field from some segment of charge here, some segment of the wire here, uh, a small amount of the charge dQ is given by lambda dx. This distance squared from this point to that point is given by uh, the x value squared plus the z value squared. And then our unit vector between the, so we're going to use symmetry here. Um, and there's no, um, we're going to use the fact that the x component of this segment of wire exactly cancels out the x component of that segment of wire. So we're only going to worry about the z component. But we still want to, uh, we want, need to figure out the, the factor there for that r hat. So the r hat in this case is uh, going to be if we have here, this distance is uh, r cosine theta, and this distance right here is r sine theta. So our r hat is sine theta x hat plus cosine theta y hat. Uh, and then, ah, sorry, I used y hat. The, uh, this has z, we're putting this in the z direction, not the y, y direction. So cosine theta, z hat. So if we, if we are using the fact that the x components cancel out, then a small segment of the electric field in the z direction is given by q sorry, k lambda d, k lambda, I have my cosine theta dx, and then here I have an x squared plus z squared. Um, now I have to figure out how to write cosine x in a useful way. Cosine of x is or sorry, cosine of theta in a useful way. I can't do, so cosine of theta depends on x, but I'm trying to integrate over x. So I want to write this instead as z over the square root of x squared plus z squared. All right, that means that I can put this all together and say that the z component of the electric field is k lambda z dx over x squared plus z squared to the three halves. And then I want to integrate from negative L over 2 to positive L over 2. I am going to pull out all of my constant factors. And I'm going to write this in terms of unitless numbers because I like to write my integrals in terms of unitless numbers. So I'm going to pull a z squared out on the bottom. And one of those z squareds cancels this z squared. So I can write this as dx over z x squared over z squared plus 1. And then to all to the three, ah, I actually have to do a z cubed. So I have a z squared here. And then, 
let's see, I want to check my units here. So this is distance times distance divided by distance cubed. So this should be 1 over z. So I think I've got an extra factor of z here. I do a z. This is all unit. This is unitless. And this has units of 1 over, OK, yes, this has units of 1 over distance. So I've pulled the correct number of z's out. And then this form I want to look up in my integral table. All right, so I can look up in the integral table that the integral of x over 1 plus, I'm oh, sorry, the integral of, no, x, the integral of 1 plus x squared to the 3 halves is equal to x over the square root of 1 plus x squared. All right, and if we check units here, if this had units of length, this is length divided by length cubed, so 1 over uh, x squared. This should have units of 1 over x squared, and then you do the integral, and it has, ah, this only works if I have unitless, well, I have my unitless quantity here, so I'm going to trust the convenience of my unitless quantity, and I am going to jump from, let's double check that I still have sufficient marker, I'm going to jump down here, plug this in, and Ah, here my units are, my limits are negative L over 2Z to positive L over 2Z. And here I have the Z component of the electric field is equal to K lambda over Z. And then L over 2Z over 1 plus L over 2Z squared, square root, minus a negative L over 2z over 1 plus L over 2z quantity squared. So I get a factor of 2 there. So here I have k lambda over z times L over z times 1 over 1 plus L squared over 4Z squared, square root. And then here, this is this has units of charge per unit length, and this has units of length, and that is uh, newtons per, so this should give me newtons per coulomb, and K has newtons per coulomb squared times coulombs 
per length squared. So it has the correct units. And now I can talk about what happens as we let the length go to infinity. Um, if we, let's see, if we let the length go to infinity, uh, this form doesn't quite work out. Uh, because if you let the length go to infinity, this tells you the electric field goes to infinity. All right. Now, that shows you how to set up a problem when you have the, um, when you have the, a, a more complicated form than just a simple charge. Now we're going to work through a couple of, so the basic, the basic protocol is that you start with this form for the electric field for a small segment, you calculate your segment of charge, dq, you calculate your distance for that small segment of charge, watch the unit vector, because the unit vector is going to lead to a number of cancellations, um, and then setting up the integral is the hardest part. Uh, once you've set up the integral, you just proceed with calculating the integrals, and there will usually be some cancellations, especially in the types of problems that you're going to encounter in an introductory class, you're going to run into a lot of simplifications or else the math very rapidly becomes intractable. If you, if you do have to do integrals with intractable math or where it gets extremely ugly, I recommend the buddy system, which means work with one of your friends and um, double check your work. The, if you really have to do it, you can also use a number of tools <clears throat> for calculating integrals carefully. All right, now we can take a slightly different problem. This is calculating the electric field from a ring of charge. Um, and we're going to follow the same protocol. Uh, and we are going to draw out this small segment of charge. So our charge, and we're going to use this result for the next slide, so we're going to keep track of it. So a small segment of charge is going to be the uh, linear charge density, where the linear charge density now is the total charge divided by 2 pi r. Um, and so a small segment of charge is r, is lambda r d theta, because this segment is r d theta. Now, our integral is going to be really easy because we're integrating over theta, and it doesn't, the, um, the, the integral is, going, is not going to, the uh, total electric field from each segment is not going to cha change. So here we're going to write each piece of it. So dq is lambda r d theta. R squared now is capital R squared plus Z squared because wherever we are on, are on the ring, it's always R squared, the square root of R squared plus Z squared away. Now the unit vector is a little bit tricky. So now um, in this segment, our uh, angle here we have this length is r cosine phi. This length is r sine phi. And our unit vector is going to be r hat equals, we'll just look We'll look only in the case where we're exactly on the y-axis because we're going to end up letting the x and y components cancel each other out for different parts of the ring. So the, um, the unit vector in that case is cosine phi z hat plus well, in that, if we were over here on this segment, it would be plus sine phi y hat. 
Now, everything except for the, uh, the Z hat components is going to cancel out. N so we're not going to worry about this. And we're going to write cosine of phi. Um, so we're going to write cosine of phi in terms of these variables. And that is z over r squared plus z squared square root. All right, so then we put this all together and we get that. Switch markers up. The electric field in the z direction is k lambda r d theta z over r squared plus z squared square root times r squared plus z squared. And we need to take the integral from 0 to 2 pi. This integral now is exceedingly easy because the um, because there is no phi dependence. So we get 2 pi r lambda k z over r squared plus z squared to the 3 halves. And this happens to be the total charge. So I'm going to write this up in the corner because we're actually going to use it for the next step, oh, for the next example. We can take this disk and integrate over it and calculate what you get for the charge from, or integrate this ring and calculate what you get for the charge on a disk. So for a for a ring, EZ is equal to K times the charge on the ring times Z over R squared plus Z squared to the three halves. And we'll erase this segment here. And now we're going to move on to integrate over multiple rings in order to calculate what you get for a disk. So what we can do here is look at, so for each disk, so we're going to, each ring, we're going to make a, the, so the charge on the ring is going to be, we're now going to draw a ring with a finite width dr. So the charge on the ring is equal to 2 pi r d r times, I'm going to put it out in front here, the density of the charge density per unit area. So that is going to go in here. And then um, 
That is the Z component alone. So we don't have to, if we start with the ring, we don't have to worry about the, the um, DQ and the R and the R hat because we have already, we're just starting with rings and we're adding up the electric fields from the rings. So this is going to be the integral from 0 to R uh, of a bunch of small rings, K, and then times sigma 2 pi R D R. Now this should be This should be a little r because we are now integrating o over a smaller ring inside of here. And then we have, that's the q, and then we have z r squared plus z squared to the three halves. And now we have to do this integral. Ah, and this should be little r. All right, I am, so now we can, I'm, we can write this as, but we can write a u substitution because I see that if I make u equals r squared plus z squared, then du equals 2r dr. So I'm going to pull out my constants in the front. I have k, sigma, I'm going to keep the 2, I'm going to pull out the pi, and I also have a constant z. And then I have the integral from 0 to capital R of 2R dr. That gives me a du. And then here, this is u cubed. Because this, my u has a has the is r squared plus z squared. Let me quickly check units to make sure that I didn't make an algebra mistake. I'm mainly changing around the um, distance units. So I have one, two, three powers of distance in the numerator and three powers of distance in the denominator. So this See, this is distance squared, the square root of that. Ah, here I have to have a three halves. That's why I did that check. So this gives me distance cubed. This is distance times distance squared, or distance cubed, divided by distance cubed. So this is, so my length, my lengths cancel out, I still have the correct units. I'm walking you through this so that you learn how to check yourself when you do your own work. All right, we are not gonna change the limits because we will change it back to, uh, to R before we plug everything in. So this is K sigma, so I'm just gonna drop the limits and we'll put them back in in a minute. K sigma pi, z, now this is u to the negative 3 halves. So when I integrate, I get, I want to uh, increase the power by 1. So negative 3 halves plus 1 is negative 1 half. And then I divide by a negative 1 half or multiply by a negative 2.
and then we'd put our limits in there, but I'm going to change it back to R first. Let me quickly check myself. This would give me a U to the negative 3 halves when I take the derivative. That's good. All right, so that tells me this is K sigma pi Z. I'm going to put my negative 2 out in front. Um, and then I have uh, 1 over r squared plus z squared square root evaluated between 0 and r. And when I have, uh, so here I have a negative 2. Pi sigma k z and then this is one over capital R squared plus z squared square root and this is and then minus one over the square root of z squared, or 1 over z. And I'm going to use the neg distribute the negative sign and flip the sign back. I get 2, I'm going to pull a z out as well, 2 pi sigma, and then here, I have z over z this number is one over r over z quantity squared plus 1 square root. Ah, and then I actually want to have, so this will be a 1 minus 1 over r over z quantity squared plus 1 square root. All right. This is a big ugly equation. I'm going to delete these guys. So I have 2 pi sigma. Now, as I, I can do a couple things, um, this is going to make the, so here, if we get z much, much larger than r, then this becomes, you end up with, um, only, uh, let's see, that's not the easiest limit. What's, what you can see here is if you let r go to infinity, then you end up with a constant electric field. So, that actually we use for the next one, let r go to infinity, you have an infinite plate and for an infinite plate, let me actually just write this up in the corner real quick. So for the electric field of a ring in the z direction, we get 2 pi sigma 1 minus 1 over r over z squared plus 1 square root of that. We will use that in our next term.
because what we're going to do is let this take the limit of this as r goes to infinity. And when that happens, the second term disappears. And you get a nice, neat constant. And that is an incredibly useful example that will come up over and over and over again, which is the charge on a plane. All right. So here, we now let the, um, if we let r equal infinity, now, if you have an infinite sea of charge, everywhere you look, everything looks the same. If you go up, you still see an infinite sea of charge. You're not very sensitive to the distance you are from the, from the charge itself, from the top, from the plane. So you have then a symmetry where, um, first of all, you, you only have a z direction because if you had any direct x direction, when you move around on that plane, you change the, um, you change your perspective, it will look like you are, it will still look like the same place. You can't, if you had any x or y component, you wouldn't have this translational symmetry where wherever you go on the plane, it all looks the same. Okay, so the electric field then in a plane is 2 pi sigma in the z hat direction. Now, we have two charges of opposite, so a charge density plus sigma on one plane and a charge density minus sigma on the other plane. So now, you have a separation between the charges when you are, so the electric field from this plane is going to point in that direction, and the electric field from inside, in between the two plates, the electric field is going to point in this direction. Let me actually just draw the individual electric fields. So this is going to be our color for this guy, and you have electric field lines that go like this here, we try to draw them all the same. And on the outside, they go like that. When you are, uh, and then from the other plane, we have electric field lines which go like this here and like that there. It's always pointing away, or, sorry, it is pointing towards because this is a negative um, field line, so it's always going to be pointing towards the plate. Ah, and I have to switch my arrows here, because it's always pointing towards the plate. Okay, so when you are between the plates, the electric fields add up together. If you are, and let me draw a couple more fields, now your field from this guy is still in this direction. So now the yellow arrows exactly cancel out the purple arrows. And then when you are on this side, the purple arrows exactly cancel out the yellow the yellow arrows. So if you have two parallel plates and you add up their electric fields inside the plates, you have a constant electric field, a roughly constant electric field. Outside of the plates, you have roughly zero field. This example is going to come up over and over and over again when we do our problems trying to calculate the electric fields and, and calculate what happens to charges. It's also going to come up when we touch on circuits because this is, um, this is a parallel plate capacitor. And what this result means is that anytime you're, um, you have two plates of charges where the size of the plate is much larger than the separation between the plates, 
you have roughly a constant electric field. And with that, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna stop here and I will see you guys next time when we introduce Gauss's Law. Thank you.